many of you know that to be true in your own life? There's no one like Jesus. People can fail you. Everyone you love, everyone you've trusted your whole life can fail you. But I'm telling you, Jesus never fails. He will never let you down. He deserves our glory tonight. He deserves all the praise, the honor that we can give him. Right where you're standing, if you would, just take just a moment. And we've been worshiping him, but would you just take a moment to let him know how much you love him? Let's just fill this atmosphere with love for Jesus tonight. That, Lord, we want you to know how awesome you are and how mighty you are and how much we love you, Lord. We need you in our lives. We can't take another breath, God, if it's not filled with the essence of who you are. God, you touch us and you minister in our lives tonight. We give you praise and we give you honor and we give you all the glory. You deserve the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands in worship as we magnify your name. You deserve the glory all the glory and the honor. Lord, we lift our hands in worship as we magnify your name. You are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like There is no one else like you. You are great. You do miracles so great. There is no one else like you. There is no one else like you. Hallelujah. I love you tonight, Jesus. I love you, Lord. Hallelujah. While you're standing, if you would, turn with me to Genesis chapter 4. I'm going to read three different passages of scriptures tonight. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 16. Then we're going to jump over to Psalm 51. And they'll have it up on the screen. That's a lot of turning tonight. But if you're brave and you're daring, Psalm 51 and verse 10. And then lastly, Psalm 16, verse 9. Entitled this message tonight, Where Could I Go? Where Could I Go? Genesis chapter 4, verse 16 says, And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, on the east of Eden. Let me read that again. And Cain, we remember Cain, one of two brothers, in the very beginning of our first family. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Then we jump over to Psalm 51 and we find ourselves in a completely different scenario, different story completely. It's a psalm of David. He says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. And our last scripture tonight is Psalm 16 and verse 9. It says, Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Verse 11, Thou wilt show me the path of life in thy presence is fullness of joy, and at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Let's pray tonight. 
Father, as we come before you, I ask that you will anoint your word. Anoint your servant. Anoint our time, our ears to hear. And Lord, let this time that we've come together in your house, Lord, let it bring change in us. Let it touch us and transform us. Pray by your Holy Spirit, your words will become life to us, Lord, as we give ourselves to you. I pray that you will free in this place. Your Holy Spirit, the angels of God will be free to work in every heart and in every life. I come against any hindering, hindering spirits, anything the enemy would try to do to try to come in a side door. I come against the enemy's work in this house and I ask you, Father, set us all free to hear, free to receive, free to be filled with the joy of the Lord, which is our strength. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Where could I go? First of all, before I go any further, it's so good to see all the folks who are visiting with us tonight. Marna and Dave Salyer, thank you so much for being here with us. You're wonderful folks, and we're so glad you're here. We know why you were here. The Baker boy, Luke, getting uh, baptized tonight, and Salyer's, many of the family members are here tonight. God bless you, and thank you for being with us. You're your family to us. We're glad that you're here tonight. In this scripture passage that we're looking at tonight, the two men that we talk about, there's two men we read about. The first was Cain, the second was David. You would think, why would we compare those two? Why would we go into a detail about looking at them and their lives? And why, how could that be relevant to us tonight? It is relevant because in the day and an hour where we're living, there's, we need all the keys to success that we can possibly gather. We need to find out from the Word of God what helps us to be strong and mighty in these last days. It's important for us to know, first of all, it is the last days. Jesus Christ is coming very soon. And it's right for us to make sure that in our hearts and in our lives, we are doing everything that we can to stay in tune with what the Spirit is doing and what He wants accomplished in our own lives. I know how, if you're anything like me, I know my next breath. I trust him for that. I trust him for the heartbeat of my body. I trust the Lord for all that he is, that all that he is in my life. He's my strength. He's my peace. If I feel any joy, he's my joy. If I feel any love in my life, he's my love. He is all those things to me. And his word says that he will be. In this scripture passage, two men in these scriptures have sinned. One thing we know about both of them, if you bring up, hey, man, what do you know best about David or what do you know best about Cain? You're probably going to bring up the fact that they got in trouble. They ended up failing God, their families, themselves, and they ended up sinning in their lives. One of them, though, we read in that scripture in the first, uh, first one, Genesis chapter 4 and verse 16, we read that Cain, it said, went out from the presence of God. But then you read in verse 12 of Psalm 51, and you see that, that uh, David, I'm sorry, verse 11 says, cast me not away from thy presence. Two completely different parallels. You've got one who's so ashamed and so guilt-ridden by his sin, so, so completely destroyed by what has happened in his life. He's allowed the, the anger and the, you know, the Bible even talks, God said to Cain, he looked at him, he said, why are you so angry? Before he even went out and did what he did, God tried to warn him. He said, man, why are you so angry? But Cain let his anger turn into bitterness and his bitterness into rage. And that sin destroyed him. We never really know what happens to Cain. There's no written record about him ever coming back into the safety of God's presence. But we know that the scripture says in, in chapter 4, verse 16, it says, And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, on the east of Eden. But then we've got in Psalm 51, David is saying, cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. We know that Cain committed murder. We know that David more or less committed murder. We know that in both of their lives, it was just a treacherous sin that separated them from God. But one let the sin destroy him and he ran from God and left out of the presence of God. And David 
even in the middle of his sin, in the middle of his torment, when he was approached and confronted, he looked up to God and it broke him in his spirit. That's why the Bible talks about David having a broken and a contrite heart because he was one that when he was caught up in the sin, he was like any other man. But when he got confronted, his heart confronted him too. And his heart was a heart after God. And when he thought of himself and it finally dawned on him, the reality of what he had done had hit him in the face. It's when he said, oh Lord, cast not thy presence from me. And I know what that's like. There have been many different times in my life when I, I thought, oh Lord, I've got to have your presence. I, got, I, I can go through anything that I do as long as I've got your presence, then I'll be all right. I know in my life many different times the Lord has pulled his presence back from me. He knows that'll get my attention. Doesn't it get yours? Is, it get, is he ever able to, to pull back from you? And then, boy, that's when you start finding out, man, I, I got to get somewhere. I got to be off somewhere. I know what it's like to feel at times when I feel a little empty inside or I feel like things are not really gelling. And, and, and I've come into a, you know, a time when I season where I feel like he's just far away from me. And those times and hours, I can't stand it. I don't know about you. I can't hardly, ha I can't handle it. I want to get off somewhere. I can be talking to people, laughing, be at a dinner at a lunch. And, and if I feel like I've been separated from him, I've got to go off somewhere and get a hold of him. I want to hear a sweet song or I want to read a scripture and I want it to touch my heart. I want to get in his presence. If I've got his presence, I can go through anything. And David apparently had that kind of heart. He knew what he had done. He knew how far it had gone. He knew that, that what he had done was absolutely just terrible. But at the thought of what it had done in separating from God, when that finally dawned on him and it, the reality of it hit him, well, he couldn't take it. And he said, cast not your presence from me, nor take your spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with my free spirit. What's the difference between these two? Well, it's obvious. And it's an important observation. Something that'll speak to us tonight. I pray and I desire that in our church, we'll always desire the Holy Spirit in his presence. I don't ever want to be in a dead, dry church service. Uh, you, Gary and I talk all the time. I talk with our staff all the time. We, we'll literally, we'll, we'll measure. We'll, we'll say, hey, man, what, what, what was it like? You know, that, that was a little, you know, maybe a, that wasn't as, as exciting. Or maybe that we didn't feel the presence of the Lord as strong. Or, or we'll, we'll talk about the services. I, I come in here on a, on a Sunday night, and my first prayer when I get over there while we're getting ready and getting started is I start praying, Lord, let your presence be here in the house. For, Lord, we can do anything. It, it, we can have fine speakers and we can have great singers, but if, at all the, if all of it, when it's come together, there's not an anointing that brings the Spirit of God in here to change lives, then we have wasted our time. It's the Spirit of God that changes men and women. It's the Spirit of God that changes our lives. It's the Spirit of God that calls men and women to ministries. It's God's Spirit that will literally be the thing that will turn your life upside down and give you hope for tomorrow. But we see here two, two extreme examples of what happened when failure came in to the lives of these two men. It reminded me when, when, when I was reading the scriptures and studying and, and going back over this, is an old song it says, where could I go? Oh, where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul, needing a friend to save me in the end. Where could I go but to the Lord? We remember Peter knew that too when, when people were leaving and going away and then some of the disciples were falling away and Jesus looked at them and said, will you too go away? Peter jumped up under the anointing, I believe, of the power of God. And he said, where else would we go? You alone have the words of life to us. You alone are the, you're the son of the living God. You are the one, the, the one we looked for, the one we hoped for. How was it for you when you finally found Jesus, when you were lost in this world and had no hope of eternal life in Christ? What was it like for you on the night you got saved? What was it like for you when Jesus came revealing his love to you? Was it something hardly able, you were hardly able to contain yourself, the excitement? Was it something that really blessed and touched your 
your life, it touched mine. And when the presence of God was revealed to me, I'm telling you, it, it lit me up. And I was so excited. I remember the night I went home. I laid in the bed all night long. I just couldn't hardly stand it. I was completely transformed and touched by God's power. I wouldn't have a salvation experience any less, ladies and gentlemen. If you have come to Christ and it's merely a form and it's merely words that you prayed in a prayer somewhere at a general meeting, I'd tell you, you ought to get over somewhere in an altar and find the true living waters of Jesus and let him touch your life. Where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go but be in his presence? You know, everyone has highs and lows. Everyone goes through times when you're on the mountaintop and times when you're down in the valley. If you are on the mountaintop all the time in your life, then I kind of I kind of wonder what kind of threat you are to the enemy. Most everyone I know is close to God, who's lived a life close to God. Most of them have lived going into valley experiences and into mountaintop experience. Thank God for the mountaintop experiences. Amen. Thank God for the times when the Spirit of the Lord moves, when He comes on the scene and brings a miracle of light. Thank God for those times when, oh, you can't do anything wrong. We've come in here sometimes on a Sunday, and man, from the very first note, people were out in the aisles. People were getting a hold of God. People were running the aisles. One night, we had four people running. I thought we ought to have a traffic light up in here. It was amazing. The way the Spirit of the Lord was moving, the power of God. One night, we had 12 folks get saved right, at, right after we got done with one of our praise and worship songs. The Holy Spirit stopped the service and said, ask them right now. There's, there's people that want to get saved. 12 hands went up all over the place, and people got saved. I love it when we're on the mountaintop. I love it when everything's going good. I love it when the Spirit of God is leading and guiding and the, the Word is right, and we feel like, man, we have been in the presence of the Lord. There's nothing better than than that but we really wouldn't know about those mountain times would we if we didn't at times go through the valley sometimes we go through the the dark hours the times when things are a little despairing and a little discontent our lives are discontent filled with dis discontent times when we feel like things are not going so right and we're looking and we're struggling and we're reaching everyone has those times don't let them fool you Everyone has those times. If we, if we look at the mountaintop experiences in people's lives, if anyone ever tells you stuff like that, that they are always living on the mountain, they're always in a high, and they're always just naming and claiming and running and blabbing and grabbing, then I don't believe they're telling it all like it really is. Because I'm going to tell you something that, I, that, that you don't hear a lot of times. I believe God uses the valley experiences in the high experiences. I believe they join together and they work necessarily in our lives. I know that I have learned more in those hours that were dark in my life. I've learned more through tears. I've learned more through having to get a hold of the Lord because it was a crisis or a trouble in my own family. I knew what it was like when, when we walked into an emergency room and my mom was laying back on the bed back in the ER in room 33. And I remember, you know, when your mom is my mom, see? That's how we know the difference between what's real, a real crisis and what isn't. If it, they always said, you know, real surgery is, is my surgery, not yours. Serious surgery is my surgery, not yours. But where she laid back there and then all of a sudden the, all the numbers went crazy and she coded right there in the room and doctors and nurses were running everywhere. It was right there in that hour. I wasn't worried about Kettering Hospital, wasn't really concerned about all the doctors and who had the best reputation. All I knew in that moment was I needed to go go find a little spot somewhere where I could get a hold of the Lord. And I wasn't worried about who was hearing me. I wasn't worried about my Pentecostal roots. I wasn't ashamed of the fact that I'll cry out to God in prayer. I wasn't ashamed I was ready at that moment in time to get a hold of God. And it was in those hours that I've learned how to get a hold of the Lord. It's in times in my lives when I didn't know where the answer was going to come from. When I didn't have a clear view of what I was supposed to do next. It was when I had to get in his word and I had to find his will. And I had to study the scriptures to know what to do. It was in those hours that I grew spiritually that I was stronger and that I was better than I was before. I was closer to the Lord. And it's in those hours when, Brother Orville, he pulls his presence back from me that I find myself searching deeper after him. 
I want to get to him. I want to find him wherever he's at. And a lot of times he'll do that just so he can get you in a deeper walk in a place with him. So he uses the highs and the lows. He did it all throughout the scripture. You remember some of the greatest men and women of the Bible had the mountaintop experiences and the valley experiences. So don't feel bad. Tonight, if you have found yourself going through difficult times, if you found yourselves going through the trials or you've had troubles in your life or you've had those times when you feel empty and you feel a little cold, feel a little numb, how many would even admit it, man? A lot of folks don't want to admit that sometimes you don't feel very saved. Sometimes you don't feel like a fired up Christian. Sometimes you don't feel like you can just run through a troop and leap over a wall. There are times you feel dead as four o'clock in the morning. There are times the phone will ring and my first response isn't like Superman ready to go out and take charge. There are times I'm like, instead of saying, amen, I say, oh, me. I found myself at times coming in on Sunday, Sunday night, there were a couple Sunday nights, you know, we had, we had several weeks back, I remember we had, those, we had some powerful services in the morning, and I was drained, I was tired, and I came, went home over the afternoon, and I was trying my best, I had a lot of things to do, and I'm watching the clock, and about five o'clock, my body said, no. No, I don't want to preach. But you know, it wasn't a few minutes after I got here. I found that when I get back in his presence, everything changes. I get back if I can just get through that difficult time. If I can just push through that five o'clock and get here to six. As soon as six hits and the piano starts and the choir starts warming up and, and the, the orchestra is tuning up. Man, when, when the spirit of God begins to move and the saints begin to sing, all of a sudden out of nowhere, I get this surge of strength and energy that comes from heaven. And it begins to light me up and I become quickened and alive in my spirit. And then, oh, everything's all right then. Everything's all right then. If you can just push through those hard times. And that's the key to what this scripture passage is all about. Moses was one of those people. Man, he, was, he had the mountaintop experiences of all mountaintop experiences. I mean, if you're going to have a mountaintop experience, let's have a burning bush up on Mount Horeb. Let's have a burning bush experience. He had the mountaintop. He was given the Ten Commandments. Man, that would have been a great day. I mean, you can imagine how he felt that day. You know, here, I mean, I would imagine he had been in a good mood. I just got the tablets. I just got the Decalogue. I just got the Ten Commandments of God Almighty. Man, this is a great day. I'm on top of the mountain. But we also remember there was a time when, when he was given the Ten Commandments, but there was a time when he broke them as well. There was a time when he came down off the mountain in anger and lightning and thunder. Nothing was going right. Highs and lows, brave, courageous Moses had his good days and his bad days. What about the life of Paul? Paul, one of the greatest Christians in the New Testament, one of the greatest men of God ever. But Paul, man, different times, different seasons in his life. Do you remember here reading the story of him when he was writing a letter to his son, Timothy, in the spirit, in the, in the, in the ministry? And he, he said, uh, come to me, bring me my cloak. Come to me, man. Don't, don't let winter come without it. I want you to come and be, I just need your companionship. I just need your friendship. I know you're pastoring. I know you're doing the work over there, but I need you to come. I'm in prison. I'm cold. Winter's coming, and I don't have my cloak. I left it off somewhere. I need you to bring a friend. I need a friend. Paul having a downtime. How many times did he find himself in trouble? How many times did he find himself in the mountaintop? And there were times, you know, when the angel's standing before you and we're written, getting ready to go through a trial, but the angel says, you will stand before Caesar in Rome. Boy, that's an up time, right? That's a good time. That's, boy, that's a, a message, a word coming from God Almighty. He's got powerful energy then. Boy, when everybody else is running in fear of their lives, Paul's standing out there saying, gentlemen, stand with me. Hell, the those who will stay right here with me, you're assured to your visit to Rome. He was just on top of the mountain. But boy, then you get another picture of a man being lowered over the side of a wall in a basket. And you wonder, you wonder if he had his ups and his downs, his good times and his bad times. Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet. Young man called of God, used of God, wrote the word of God, given the words of God, the powerful presence of God in his life. And yet, 
coined the weeping prophet because he felt so awkward and he felt he didn't want to do the work that he'd been called to. And that would lead us to another guy, one of the greatest evangelists that ever hit, Jonah. And we know the story of Jonah. Boy, Jonah had his ups and he had his downs. All throughout the scripture we find people. You know, Jonah went off into Nineveh and he was having, you know, he had went through what he had been, went through. You know, he learned a powerful lesson in the belly of the whale. And there he was in the middle. He finally finds his way to Nineveh and then everybody in the town gets saved. He's, pro- he's preaching and he's, man, he's so anointed. He just come out of that belly, I'd be anointed too. <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be preaching the best message I ever preached in my life. And man, God will set you free from the belly of the whale. He'll be there for you, man. He'll help you. And boy, those people, they responded and everybody got saved. But then you find him sitting not very long underneath one of them little fruit things he had. And he, he's just crying out to God and he's in a miserable shape. And that takes you to the story of Elijah who called down fire, made fun of the prophets of Baal, called down fire from God on the altar, said, pour water around it. Let's make this thing harder for, for the false gods and called it all around. And then he looked up and said, I call on the God of fire. It came down. But then it wasn't just a few more hours. You find him under the juniper tree and he's praying to die because old Jezebel's threatened his life. Ups and downs, highs and lows. The difference, the difference between all of those people and the people who go through the troubles and the trials, the ups and the downs. The difference between the ones who make it, the ones who don't make it, the ones who go through, push through and end up back on the mountain versus the ones who continue the trek downward. And boy, we know them. Sometimes it's very close people to us, our loved ones, people we care about, people we want to see and we want to know they're walking streets of glory in the eternal life that's been promised to believers. The highs and the lows, some make it through and some don't. What's the difference? I think we see it in our scripture tonight. Some people, they go through those times and they bounce right back, Melissa. They go through the hard and difficult times and they find themselves back up on the mountain. Awesome. Some people, some people go through those trials, go through those hard times, and they don't bounce back. They don't find their way back. They let the bitterness, they let the rage, they let the sin, they let the anger, they let the wound, they let the hurt, they let it bury them. And they don't find their way back. What is it that makes the difference? What about people that, that get wounded and hurt in our families? Or feelings hurt. It's never perfect in marriages. Even when they tell you it is, it's not. It's not always perfect. I mean, you guys, you know what I'm talking about. There are times when in that beautiful, perfect marriage of yours, you want to take a walk. <laughs> times you want to disappear for a little while. There are times when I have found that in my own life, even just discouraging times or even times in the church. <gasps> there are times even in the church where woundings and hurt and hurt feelings and things take place. What is the difference? How do you get through that discouragement? How do you get through the woundings? How do you get through the hurtful times? How do you get through the crisis tragedies that come your way in your life and then get back up on the mountain? It's important to know what to do. David had it right there. In that verse 11, when he said, cast not me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. See, when Cain sinned, Cain went out from the presence of God. He ran. He stayed away. He walked. David could not. But that was the difference. That was the difference. And that's what ministers to you and I tonight. Both sinned. One said, I will leave the presence of God. And one said, I will stay in the presence of God. What does it mean when you say the presence of God? 
when you talk about, okay, David said, I want to stay in your presence. Cain said, I'm going to go out from the presence. Well, what does that mean, the presence of God? We'll say, I feel the presence of God. We'll talk about the presence of the Lord in the services. It's all of those things that make God real. It's everything about his essence, everything about who he is. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're right with God. It didn't, that scripture there where David was talking in Psalm 51, that was a powerful verse of scripture. That whole passage, that whole chapter in Psalms, it's a beautiful scripture of, of forgiveness and repentance. It tells you how, if you're going to repent, I remember as a young Christian, I, when I was sorry and I feel like I had blown it with God, I would go to Psalm 51. I'd get on my knees in my bedroom and I'd hold Psalm 51 up in the air and I'd read it out to God and tears dripping down my face. And I'd, I'd say that's the best repentance prayer I've ever prayed. And if it worked for David, it'll work for me. So I got off and I, so I would read that prayer and I would say that prayer to God. I don't know how many times growing up doesn't mean the presence of God when, when Cain said, I'm going to leave out from the presence, or when David said, I want to stay in the presence. It didn't mean that David was necessarily right with God. So being in the presence of God doesn't necessarily mean you're right with God and a right relationship with God. You're sitting next to your wife here tonight. You know, there are times, y'all are married and y'all are, you know, in a good relationship, but there are times when you're not in a right relationship with her. She'd rather you not be there at all. Not anybody here. This is out there. <laughs> Being with God in his presence doesn't always mean that that's a right standing and a right relationship. I can, this pulpit can represent the presence of God and I can be, the presence of God can be there, but I can, I can do what Cain did and I can walk away from it. Or I can be like David and I can, I'd say, I, I just want to be near it. He, he had so much yet to go through. You don't find the forgiveness in his life until you get to Psalm 32. You got to go back and read Psalm 32 and then you see it's changed. In Psalm 51, he's like, oh, wretched man that I am. I've sinned, Lord. I am terrible. My sin is ever before me. This is horrible. I have failed you miserably. I deserve to go down in the pit. I'm most miserable, God. Please restore the joy of my salvation. And don't take your presence from me. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. But, oh, in Psalm 32, it's a whole different story. There you find the forgiveness, and he starts singing a brand new song. Repentance doesn't necessarily mean, doesn't necessarily mean that that's a right standing with God in his presence. But Psalm 16 and 11 says something that's important for us. That third scripture we read tonight in our passage of scripture, it says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. And at thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. It didn't say in his presence, I have fullness of joy. It said in his presence is fullness of joy. There's a way to be in the presence of God, to stay connected to the presence of God, even when you feel like you got to get things right. Even when you feel like you got, you, you're going through the dark time or a difficult time or a trial time. You know, once you have tasted the power of God and the presence of God, once you've been in his glory and you've been walking with him and you've been talking with him and you've had that relationship with him, the fellowship, man, you're absolutely kind of ruined for life. You can't go back. It's impossible to really go back. People say they do, and they say that they, when they walk away from God's presence, Yo, Cain, you know, I'm sure and when he walked out and left, he didn't walk out, you know, thinking that's it, that's the last, I don't have to worry about it anymore. I'm sure every day of his life he was marked. Every day of his life he was miserable. Every day of the, the backslider's life, they're miserable. They remember when God touched them. They remember what it was like to feel his presence. They remember when the tears would flow down their faces. Don't let them fool you. They remember the power power of God at work. If you've ever tasted him once, you can't go back to the world and be the same again. You might go back, you may go running, but you'll be running the rest of your life and you'll always be looking over your shoulder wondering when he's going to catch up with you. I've found when I get off somewhere and I don't feel his presence, I can't function. I've got to have his presence. You're never the same again. Pleasures of the world they lose their spark. They, I remember in, in youth ministering years ago, a young man, he was just so rebellious and he had failed and, and, and went the opposite direction and he, he didn't want anybody to tell him what to do. He didn't want anybody to help him out. And, and I remember he called me one night and it was about three or four in the morning and called me on the phone and he said, Ray, 
What do you do when you've done everything that they ever told you not to do and you're still miserable and unhappy and unfulfilled? And the only thing I knew to do was tell him, I said, come home to Jesus. It's impossible to have been touched by him, to have felt him and had his spirit at work in your life. It's impossible. I don't think anyone who's genuinely ever been touched by the Lord. David, we're praying for many lost loved ones, sons and daughters. All across this congregation, there are many folks we're praying for. I'm telling you, there's no way that they've ever been touched by him that they don't know that presence and the difference. David knew that. David was a mighty man and with a heart like God's. His heart was broken when he said, restore unto me the joy of my salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. In your life, the best advice to ever give a church or for us to talk about is in those times when we feel empty, in those times when we feel cold and we feel like it's hard to get through, the thing you do is you remember the words of David when he said, take not thy presence from me. In other words, what I would say to the world and what I'd say to, to, to us here in the church is in those times when we feel away from him or we feel numb or we feel cold, we're going through the hard times, stay in church. The first thing the devil likes to do, and you've seen it all throughout the word of God, is he tries to isolate us. He tries to get us off somewhere where we, you know, we don't fellowship with the believers and we don't want to go to church anymore. We don't want to hang out anymore. The best thing you can do when you're feeling cold, when you don't know what to do, when it feels like everything's falling apart, the best thing for you and I to do is to get over into the house of God somewhere. Find yourself sitting there on a pew waiting for a song or waiting for the message to get a hold of you. You know, in David's life, when he first was talking about don't take your presence away from me he wasn't necessarily in a right standing then with God he had just been confronted by Nathan the prophet Nathan was sitting there talking about a man who had a little itty bitty lamb and he's talking about another man who had a bunch of sheep and that one guy who had the bunch of sheep was greedy and he wanted the sheep of the little lamb that was over in the the one man's farm and and he went over and took it and took it away from him and stole it from him and and Nathan turned around and right about that time looked at David and said thou art that man for we remember the sin that David had committed he had went over into the the house of his next door neighbor and he had seduced Bathsheba and had a major affair with her and then killed her husband sent him off to war we understand the war and we understand the sin that was there we understand the separation that he had with God but I'm telling you, David still, the moment that Nathan turned around and looked at him and said, you are the man, and I've been that way. Whenever God, I've been off doing my thing, and I've been close enough to the Lord that I've felt his spirit, his presence. There have been times when I have felt that God, the convicting power of the spirit of God, come over me, and he has been right there saying, you know what you've done. You know how far off you are, and you need to get right with me. You need to get off somewhere where I can help you. And I've felt that, and I've known that kind of conviction in the spirit of God at work. The Bible says wherever two or more are gathered together in his name, there he is. There's his presence. The difference between Cain and David was the presence of the Lord. And that is just getting to where he is. Getting back to the place where he resides. Getting off where you know he can, you can be ministered to. You can get, if you're cold and indifferent and you feel like you're not strong like you used to be, what you do is you get off over there and you find that place where he can be your strength. In our lives and in our church, it's right for us to always be in prayer over man. God, let the house of God be anointed. Let the preacher be anointed. Let the choir be anointed. Let our time together be anointed by your spirit so that when people come into this house, they're finding God. They're looking for God. They'll find him when they get here. It's right for us to be concerned and be on our prayer mark and to be a church that's ready and in season and out of season, just like a Christian is supposed to be. We're supposed to be a place like Bethel. We're supposed to be a place where God can be, where God can, the atmosphere is set for people to be able to find the Lord. Cain left the presence of God. And we know, we, we read in the word that we don't know that he ever found his way back. But we know that David did. We know in Psalm 32, David started reading. He said this. He said, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, 
whose sin is covered. Can you imagine the relief in his spirit? See, David stayed the course. He, did, he didn't get off somewhere and get off in his sin and, and isolate himself off. He didn't go off and, and just become what he, had, what he had done. He didn't allow that to take over his life and for sin to have a dominion over him any longer. He stayed in the presence of God. He stayed close by where he knew God was, where he knew that God could still reach him. And then when Nathan the prophet had the message, he responded. And then he was forgiven and he's preaching this message now. And he says, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledge my sin unto thee and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And that he did in Psalm 51. And thou forgavest the iniquities of my sin. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found. Surely in the floods of great waters thou shalt not come nigh unto him. Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt come past me about with songs of deliverance. When he got to this place in his life, when he got to that place where the forgiveness had come home, the spirit of the Lord that he had surrounded himself with, David couldn't get away from God. And in that process, he came back. And that's what I feel like in our hearts tonight is so important for us to see. Cain shows us the example of what we ought not to do. Don't get off somewhere and get mad and bitter and get enraged and don't allow the enemy to take you further down, becoming more bitter and more enraged and more angry and upset and then getting lost off here into this world. I'm telling you that there is just a downward progression that goes when you first start getting away from the Lord. If you find yourself in failure, I've often told people before, the only difference between you and someone who is lost and on their way to hell is if you are a successful Christian every time you hit the dark time, every time you hit the failure time, every time you feel like you come and hit a brick wall, you just, you found yourself knocked down on the ground. Get up every time and keep walking towards the light of God. Keep walking and moving towards God's presence. Don't look to the left or to the right. Keep your eyes on God. People say, I don't know how to live it. I don't know what to do. God is not mad at you. He's for you. He's not against you. He's always going to be working on your behalf. He'll always have a word. He'll always have a message. He'll always have a song. There have been different times in my life when a song has been right exactly what I needed because I was keeping myself there where the presence of God could touch me. There have been times that someone's had a word for me or someone spoke to me in an altar or I felt that there was a message that was preached that was right to me. There have been different times that I have known that because I kept myself in the presence of God where he was, I didn't isolate, I didn't close myself off, I didn't go run in the opposite direction. I stayed in the middle of where I knew he could reach me. See, that's the heart of a true person who wants to get right with God, who wants things to be right with God. Man, when we want things to be right, even when we find ourselves cold and indifferent, if we'll just stay close enough to the water spigot, if we'll just stay close enough to the fire, we'll feel the warmth of God's power. And we'll push through those difficult times, we'll push through the hard times, and we'll even push through the failure times, if you will, God God's presence will always end up being the joy that restores your salvation and restores your joy in your life as strength. He says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. He promises to help us. He has got such a plan of success for us. He has no desire for you to fail. The enemy comes along and tries to tell us that man, God's mad or that God's, God's not really merciful They'll even, the, the enemy will even do stuff like mess it all up. He turn it all around. I, I remember when I was struggling and trying to become a strong Christian, I, I, would, I would think, I would, all I would ever get tempted with was that God was hard and harsh and cold and, and he's indifferent. And boy, if you fail him, he's ready to knock you right out. He'll kick you right off the road, man. If you, you don't keep your T's and your I's crossed or your I's dotted and your T's crossed, if you don't keep all that together, man, you gotta, you gotta toe the line. I'm telling you what, I don't find that anywhere in the word of God. He says that his righteousness will keep me. He says his holiness 
holiness will guide me. He says his sanctification will empower me. Everything I need in my life, he gives me. He gave me at the cross of Calvary when Jesus said, it is finished. It was in that hour that everything I ever needed to live a successful life was handed to me by the Savior who loved me. He wants us to make it. He's not a God that's looking to punish. He's not a God that wants people to perish. I don't understand people in church, Christian people, that have a sour attitude and a mean old spirit. I don't understand that. All I've ever known of God is love. All I've ever known of God is that he's a God that reaches out in mercy and love and chases after people. Well, I've seen people say that he's, they've given their testimony and they've said, boy, he's been chasing me. He wouldn't leave me alone. I'd try to get away from him. And I'd go to work and somebody would have a Bible on their desk or Somebody would open up and share with me something. I have had to over, can't count how many different times people would say, boy, every time I looked, whether I looked to the left or to the right or I tried to find my way out the door, I'd always run right into, some, right into something that told me that God was there reaching into my life. As he, did he do that with you? Did he chase you down? Did he absolutely run after you? He ran after me. He, I couldn't get away from him. I remember when the enemy was whispered in my ear, you don't want anything to do with this. You don't want to go to that camp meeting service. You don't want to get in there and, and get saved and have to change all your friends and change all your lifestyle. And You don't want to have to do it. It's too much work. You don't need to do all that. Boy, the enemy was working overtime to try to get me off track. He works so hard to get you and I to see God in a light that is wrong. And all I remember was sitting there in that service and I kept thinking, Lord, if I just knew you were really real for me. Can you imagine getting to that place where a young teenager is literally been so bombarded by the enemy, the attack of the enemy, that you're sitting there going, Lord, I just need to know you're really there for me. But it was in that moment a message was given out, and you've heard me talk about it before. W.P. Atkinson gave the interpretation, and the words that came out of his mouth, he said, if you will just come to me, I will make myself real to you. There were 3,000 people in that room, but all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I thought I was the only one. God loves you like you're the only one. God loved Cain. God loved Cain. God loved David. He called him a man after his own heart, but it certainly wasn't because David had everything perfect and that he did everything right. Perhaps you find yourself tonight, you've made wrong choices. You've found yourself off in the wilderness time or in a dark place or even in a place where tonight, even in the house of God, you feel a little numb. Oh, the glory of your presence. We, your temple, presence, the power of God, it's warm enough, it's close enough, real enough to literally take you from where you are and give you victory, victory, victory in Jesus, victory that drives every demon out, that literally turns everything around and gives you that hope that tomorrow the sun's going to shine. Things are going to be all right. There's hope for the church. There's hope for believers. If you and I will stay the course, David, that perfect example, he said, though I have failed you miserably, though I have done the worst, now that the sin is ever before me, I am a mess. But he said, take not thy presence from me. And because of that prayer, because of that desire, and because he went ahead and made sure to stay in the place where God could speak to him. I remember years ago, I had a death in our family, and I'll close with this. I, I was having a hard time. 
I didn't understand why God had allowed her to be taken like he did. And, and I was just having a real difficult time. We had prayed for healing. We had prayed for God to move. And it just seemed like everything we prayed for, the opposite happened. And I felt so alienated from God. And I remember being upset with him. First time in my life, I'd always been taught never to be upset with God. My mother always told every one of us kids, don't you ever blame God. If there's a problem, it's you. It's not God. But I found myself actually in a spot in my life where I was questioning God himself over the trial and the situation that I had found myself in. I wanted to believe him for healing. I wanted to believe him and trust him that everything was good here, but I felt like everything had went wrong. And I remember I, in my smart aleckness, I went over to the Brian, uh, yeah, Brian bookstore and I, I walked in the place and I, I saw a book and I thought, well, you know what? I'm gonna give you the opportunity to speak to me, Lord. Well, I'm sure all of heaven was just very thankful. I looked and I saw the book and it said, where is God when I'm hurting? And I said, hmm, okay, I'll give you the chance. And so I picked up the book and I thought, hmm, this one's for God. And I walked over and I was looking at some of the music and of course, being a music lover and as Ben out at Lee, hi, <laughs> she's waving. I was a music lover and I loved the group Truth and so I saw that they had a brand new album out and I was like, ah, look at this. This is for me. The book, that's for you. So I got in my car and I threw the book down on the side of the seat and I was just like, huh, I'll give you the opportunity to speak to me through this author, this book, but I'm gonna listen to truth. And I put in the CD. The first song that came up, so many souls have tested him throughout the course of time. So many still reach out to him with broken hearts and minds. To every one of them will say, without exception that they find, Jesus never fails. And I started singing that. And I'm singing along with him. And I immediately just broke broke all that hurt from the funeral and the death and I just broke in the car and I looked up and I said yes you did and he spoke my aunt loved the Lord with all of her heart some of you remember my aunt Millie she used to attend here she struggled for a whole year with cancer and then she she passed away one of the closest people to me in the whole world it devastated my life devastated my world I was ready to walk away from ministry. Y'all didn't know this. I had actually started looking for a new job. I'd put my resume together. I wasn't going to be in ministry anymore. I was so upset. I was mad. I moving myself away from his presence, not letting him speak to me. But then I'm thankful that that afternoon I gave him an opportunity. Because as they started singing that song, Jesus never fails. Jesus never fails you might as well get thee behind me satan you cannot prevail because jesus never fails and that's when i looked up and i said you did and just as sharp as anything he said no i didn't he said what you perceived as failure what you saw as a sad and horrible moment of forsaken, for feeling forsaken. He said, you don't know the other side of the story. He said, I walked into that room and held out my hand to my saint. And she looked up at me and she said, oh, so that's how you're going to do it. And he says, I took her hand and the Lord spoke this to me. He said, I danced with her. And he says, and we went into the joy of the Lord that she had waited for all of her life. And I looked up and I felt that and I broke and I repented. Oh my gosh, did I repent. I repented all day. I went home, I felt free. 
I felt light as a feather. I was like, I'm not mad at God anymore. This is so awesome. I was so happy. I was like singing that song all day. I called my family. I called my sisters. I called my mother. I called my dad. I called everybody. I was like, I'm not mad at the Lord anymore. I don't have to resign. I can still be a youth minister. And they were like, we knew you were going to come to yourself sooner or later. I remember how free I felt when I kept myself in a place where he could speak to me. That's what this message is about tonight. You go through hurts, you go through hard times, you go through cold times, you hit the valley experiences. Don't do what Cain did. God wasn't speaking in Nod. God's man wasn't in Nod. The fellowship of the believers wasn't in Nod. He wasn't gonna get what he needed there and we never heard from him again. But old David said, Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of my salvation, even as wretched as I am in this very moment. And because he kept that in his heart, God found a way. And when Nathan looked at him and said, you're the man, and God had spoke through that prophet, David knew then, all right, it's time for confession. It's time for repentance. It's time to receive forgiveness. I don't know where you are tonight. I know that the enemy loves to completely wreak havoc on the church. He loves to tear up men and women of God. He loves to get people upset and mad and critical. He loves to tear down that free, wonderful energy, that spirit of the living God that's in you when everything's all right. Don't you love it in those hours when you're like, oh, wasn't that just great? Wasn't that refreshing? Dottie Rambo singing a song. That is in love, you know, you get all blessed and you're like, oh. Some of the young people look at me going, who's Dottie Rambo? Stand with me tonight. David went on to say in that Psalm 32, he said, many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall compass him about. Mercy shall surround him. David knew, David knew he couldn't have got away from the Lord and you can't either. You and I can't get away from him. I've known people that have been running and like I said, they are still running today. One of these days, they'll finally stop, turn around, and they'll give it all back to the Lord. I've known people that the convicting power of the Holy Spirit's been on them forever. They're just miserable. Like I said, you can't have tasted the glory and the victory and the presence of God. You can't. It's impossible if you really found Him. If you really found Him, there's no way. He said, many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he that trusteth in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. He literally was sitting there going, I'm one of you now. I'm free. I know what that feels like. Do you? Are you going through difficult times? Do you feel sometimes weighted down with the burdens of the world? Do you feel like you've been going through a difficult season, a, a time when you... It's hard to remember when the manna was falling. It's hard to remember when the waters were parting. Right now, it feels like you're swimming in the deep end. If you find yourself there tonight, His presence is surrounding you. His presence is here, and He wants to relieve and set you free and give you that joy of your salvation back. This is an altar call tonight for the joy of your salvation. I feel in my heart tonight, there have been those who, you are weighed down, you are heavy. You're just trying to breathe. You're just trying to survive right now. Thank you, Jesus. He says he'll breathe fresh joy, peace, love, life in 
to you tonight. Stay in his presence. Stay in his presence. Be available. I would like to ask you, if you would tonight, to take a few moments, especially if you feel like God's speaking to you tonight, either at your seat or at this altar, would you just come for a season? It's, it's still early. A season of prayer in this altar. And if you have, if you have been feeling that weight and the burdens of life, let God set you free tonight by His Spirit. Amen. Why don't you come?